So we talked about the gas state in the last lecture. We talked about the gas laws, uh, how gases behave, and how to calculate different properties of a gas. In the liquid state, the main thing we're going to talk about, uh, which is of importance, you know, there's other things in, in the liquid state that are uh, you need to know, but these are the more important uh, items. And so in the liquid state, we have something called attractive forces, which are called van der Waals forces. And so these are the forces that hold molecules together in the liquid state. And so what happens when you go from a liquid state to a gaseous state is you break these forces, which hold molecules together, which causes the molecules to leave uh, the surface of the liquid. And that's why it takes a lot of energy uh, to boil, for example, water, is because you have to apply enough energy to break these van der Waals forces uh, so that the molecules can leave the surface of the liquid. And so we call these van der Waals forces intermolecular forces, and intermolecular forces are forces between uh, different molecules. So imagine if we all held hands and each one of us is a molecule, us holding hands would be the force that holds us together. So if we were to break the hand holding, we would float off as gaseous uh, molecules. And so depending on whether something is polar or nonpolar will dictate what type of van der Waals force or what we refer to as intermolecular intermolecular forces would exist. And so the two general types of intermolecular forces are dipole-dipole and London dispersion forces. Now with dipole-dipole interactions, these are the attractive forces between polar molecules. So in previous chapters, we talked about polar and nonpolar molecules. And so if it's a polar molecule, it will be a, it would have dipole dipole forces holding the molecules together. So, for example, if we had the molecule uh, SO2, SO2 is polar, so it the molecules of S SO2 would be linked together or held together by dipole dipole interactions. And that's because polar bonds produce dipoles. So one end of the molecule is slightly negative, one end of the molecule is slightly positive. Just to show you an example, if we use SO2, so on SO2 this is the positive end, and this is the negative end on the oxygen side. And so therefore you have this dipole that occurs or a dipole moment in the molecule. And that's why it's a polar molecule. So the negative end of one molecule is attracted to the positive end of another. And this is what holds the molecules together. So if it's a polar molecule, it has dipole-dipole interactions. Now, if it's a if it's not a polar molecule, then it would have uh, as the main inter in, as the main van der Waals force, it would have London dispersion forces. And so, London dispersion forces are what are found in nonpolar uh, molecules, or they're the main van der Waals forces uh, in nonpolar molecules. So, if you have a nonpolar molecule or nonpolar compound, I should say, it's going to have London dispersion uh, forces. And these are the forces that hold together uh, nonpolar compounds. And so unlike polar compounds where you have a permanent dipole, so one end of the molecule is always positive, one end of the molecule is always negative, in a nonpolar molecule, for instance, if we have CH4, 
So one end may be positive, one end may be negative, but it keeps on changing. It's not permanent. So that's what we call a temporary dipole. So since it's only uh, positive for a brief moment, and then it switches, it keeps on changing what's attracted to what, and so that weakens the forces that hold together the molecules of nonpolar molecules, or nonpolar compounds. So again, if it's a polar compound, polar molecules like SO2, it's going to have dipole-dipole interactions. So that's what holds the molecules together, or polar molecules. For nonpolar molecules or nonpolar compounds, London dispersion forces, or what we call a temporary dipole, um, holds the molecules of nonpolar compounds together. And so these are the two main types of the Van der Waals forces that we see in covalent compounds. We see dipole dipole for polar molecules and London dispersion forces for nonpolar. And usually nonpolar molecules, one what one group of nonpolar molecules are molecules that contain a lot of carbon and hydrogen. So if you see a molecule that only contains carbon and hydrogen, that's going to be a nonpolar uh, molecule. One other type of uh, force that holds molecules together, and uh, as you can see, it's not considered a Van der Waals force, but it's actually a subset of dipole-dipole attraction. So OH bonds are pol uh, polar, but that brings us to this topic here about OH bonds. And for OH bonds and other type of uh, certain hydrogen bonds, we have what's called hydrogen bonding. So hydrogen bonding is a very strong type of dipole, uh, dipole attraction. So it has its own separate category of uh, intermolecular force. And so hydrogen bonding is stronger than just normal dipole-dipole, which is stronger than dispersion. So if I was to draw a chart and rank these, so number one would be hydrogen bonding, number two would be dipole-dipole, and number three would be dis London dispersion. And this is how I would rank these from strongest to weakest. Now for hydrogen bonding, as in the case of OH, it has very specific requirements. So it has to have a hydrogen directly bonded to an oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine. So as in the case of OH, for example, if we have methanol, Here you see the hydrogen is directly bound to the oxygen. So this would undergo hydrogen bonding as its main attractive force. So all the molecules of uh, methanol are held together through hydrogen bond. Likewise, if we have water, So water has a hydrogen that's, attract, that's bound to an oxygen, so this would also have hydrogen bonding. So what you're looking for is a hydrogen that is directly attached to an oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine. If it meets that criteria, it, it, it has hydrogen bonding. If it's attached to a carbon or some other element, it doesn't count. It has to be an oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine. That's the criteria. So if we look at a nitrogen, say ammonia. So ammonia is NH3. You see we have a hydrogen, at least one hydrogen, that's directly bound to the nitrogen. So ammonia would have hydrogen bonding. Now for fluorine, there's only one example, and so this is the only molecule of fluorine 
with fluorine in that can hydrogen bond its HF. So again, the hydrogen bonding is very specific. It has to be a hydrogen directly attached to a oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine. If it's not directly attached, it cannot have hydrogen bonding. So what do I mean by that? For example, here, if we draw this Lewis structure, So here we have hydrogens and oxygens, but the hydrogen is not directly attached to the oxygen. So therefore, this would not have hydrogen bonding. So again, the hydrogen has to be directly attached to the oxygen, nitrogen, and fluorine. And the reason it has to be one of those three elements is in earlier chapters, we, we discussed electronegativity. And these are the three most electronegative elements on the periodic table. So that's why it has to be one of those three elements that hydrogen is directly attached to. And I spelled hydrogen wrong. No, that's right. Never mind. So what you do is you, if you have a compound, covalent compound, You ask the question, is it polar or nonpolar? And so if it's nonpolar, and the other one is polar. So you can ask the question, is it polar or nonpolar? If it's nonpolar, it's easy. The attractive forces are dispersion. Or London dispersion. If it's polar, you have to ask the question. Let me move it over here. The question you ask is Is a hydrogen, is there a hydrogen attached to a oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine? And if the answer is no, it's dipole dipole. If the answer is yes, it's hydrogen bonding. So let me write that. So if it's yes, the answer to that question, it's hydrogen bonding. If the, if the answer to that question is no, it's going to have a dipole so these are the questions you ask if you have a covalent compound. The first question you ask, is it polar or nonpolar? If it's nonpolar, it's going to have London dispersion attractive forces. If it's polar, you ask the second question, is there a hydrogen atom attached to an oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine? If the answer is yes, you have hydrogen bonding. If the answer is no, you have dipole dipole. And so just some examples of hydrogen bonding. We, we mentioned H2O, NH3, and HF. But H2O is, is quite important in hydrogen bonding because those two hydrogens can hydrogen bond with two other water molecules. And the lone pair on the oxygen can hydrogen bond with two other water molecules. So one molecule of water can hydrogen bond with four other molecules of water. And that's why water has the highest boiling point compared to NH3 and HF. So the higher the boiling point, the stronger the intermolecular forces are. And so if you remember when we, when we draw the Lewis structure of water, remember there's two lone pairs of water. on each oxygen atom. So those lone pairs, hydrogen bond 
with another water molecule, just like the hydrogen, hydrogen bonds with another water molecule. So each molecule of water can form four hydrogen bonds. And that's why water has the highest boiling point out of all three of these hydrogen bonding compounds. Because one molecule of water can hydrogen bond to four other molecules of water. And hydrogen bonding is also important in DNA. It's what holds DNA together through hydrogen bonding. So that's a biological system that's very important as well. So here I wanted to show you how we can look at polar and nonpolar compounds and kind of predict which one would have the higher boiling point or the lower boiling point. So again with what we got to remember is that higher boiling point equals stronger molecular forces or stronger attractive I can write attractive forces. So the stronger the attractive forces, the higher the boiling point and we're comparing molecules of similar size. So again you have to compare molecules So similar size would mean relatively similar uh, molecular weight. So what, what, for example, we don't want to compare water to something that has a molecular weight of 300. That wouldn't be correct. But we want to compare it to something that's, you know, similar size. It doesn't have to be 18, for example, but it has to be, you know, between, you know, no higher than, say, 100, for example. So that's what we mean by similar size. So when we're comparing molecules of similar size, the stronger the attractive forces, the higher the boiling point. So we would have nonpolar, polar, and then hydrogen bonding. So now if I was to draw three molecules, let's do CO2, uh, let's do uh, water, and let's do pH3. So we have these three molecules, and they're similar size, and we want to know which one would have the uh, we want to rank these from lower lowest boiling point to highest boiling point. So now if we draw the Lewis structure of CO2. It looks like that. If we draw the structure of pH3. It looks like this, and then if we draw the structure of H2O, as we saw earlier, it looks like this. And so now we've got to ask the question, are these polar or nonpolar? So we look at CO2, and CO2 is linear geometry, and since CO2 is linear geometry, this would be uh, nonpolar. We look at pH 3. pH 3 has this lone pair of electrons on the central atom. So whenever you see a lone pair of electrons on the central atom, that's a good indication that it is a polar molecule. So pH 3 is polar. Water has lone pairs of electrons as well so water is a polar molecule now if it's polar we got to ask the second question does it have 
a hydrogen attached to a nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine. And so here you see that the hydrogen is attached to a phosphorus. So that means there's no hydrogen bonding. So this has dipole dipole attractive forces. Now, since this was nonpolar for CO2, this has a London dispersion forces. And then for our, for water, we ask, is there a hydrogen attached to an oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine? The answer is yes. So this has hydrogen bonding. So if we were to rank these from lowest boiling point to highest boiling point, it would be in this order. So again, that's CO2 would have the lowest boiling point, H2O would have the highest boiling point. Now we look at another example. We'll look on this side. Let's you look at the molecules. Uh, we'll look at Cl2. Uh, Uh, let's see. O F or no uh, S F two and I don't know. Let's say C H three C L. CH3 OH. So we have these three molecules Cl2. So I draw that Lewis structure. CH3Cl would look like this. And then CH3OH would look like this. So again, you ask the question, is it polar or nonpolar? Uh, Cl2, since it's a molecule with the same two atoms, it's nonpolar. Because you have the same two atoms in the bonds, it's going to be a nonpolar uh, molecule. And then we look at CH3Cl. Now the fact that we have a uh, different atoms around the central atom. So see here we have three hydrogens and we have one chlorine. Since this, there's this one chlorine here, this is going to make it polar. So anytime you see different atoms around the outside of a central atom, it's going to be a polar molecule. So again, we see three hydrogens, but we have this chlorine here as the fourth atom and since it's different from the hydrogens this is going to be a polar molecule. Now with CH3OH since we have this OH here it's going to be a polar. So now we ask the question for the polar molecules does it have a, a hydrogen attached to an oxygen nitrogen or fluorine for CH3Cl the answer is no. So this would just be dipole dipole. I'll put DD uh, for it. So that means dipole dipole attractive forces. And for CH3OH, do we have a hydrogen attached to an oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine? The answer is yes. Uh, so this has hydrogen bonding.
And so the one with hydrogen bonding would have the highest boiling point, followed by the one that's polar with dipole-dipole, followed by uh, Cl2, which is nonpolar. So this would be highest boiling point. And this side would be the lowest boiling point. So again, when given a series of compounds like this, uh, this is how you determine which one would have the higher or lower uh, boiling points. Just looking at whether it's nonpolar or polar, and if it's polar, does it have hydrogen bonding? Now with the solid state, what we want to focus on, and again, we're just focusing on the important parts. Make sure you go back and look at all the, the minor stuff as well. But in solid state, we want to look at the different types of solids. So every substance at some particular temperature and pressure can be a solid. So when we talk about solids, you know, for example, we talk about water as a solid or oxygen as a solid well of course at room temperature these are not solids but there's some temperature and pressure that you could have these substances exist as a solid so when we talk about solids we're talking about solids of all substances but which necessarily which may not necessarily be a solid at room temperature or normal temperatures and so there are four categories of solids depending on the types of atoms or ions that make them up. And so the first two groups of crystalline solids, and so what we mean by crystalline means it has a regular repeat unit in the solid, so the same thing gets repeated throughout the entire crystal of the solid. So a common example of this is a crystalline solid is when you buy uh, table salt or not table salt but like uh, what's it called uh, sea salt or these these this type of salt that comes in big chunks or crystals of salt that's a crystalline solid so inside that chunk of crystal of salt are a bunch of ions of sodium and chloride arranged in a regular repeat fashion now just imagine you're playing with uh, some legos and you use the same type and same color of Lego and repeat it in three dimensions, that's what a crystal is. So a crystalline solid is a, something that gets repeated over and over the exact replica in three dimensions. And so ionic solids, the key here is it's made up of positive and negative ions, which means it's made up of cations and anions. So if you see a metal and a non-metal in a compound, it's going to be a ionic solid. So ionic solids generally contain metals, metals and non-metals. So if you look at a substance and it says what type of solid is this and you notice that it has a metal and a non-metal, it's automatically ionic solid. Can't be anything else. So that's the characteristic of an ionic solid contains metal and a non-metal. Some character some properties of ionic solids they have high melting and boiling points. So like sodium chloride, calcium chloride, they have very high melting points. We're talking above you know 500 degrees Celsius, so very, very high. They're very hard and brittle. They conduct electricity as well. So that's one type of solids. And again, the key characteristic is that it has a metal and a non-metal in the formula of the, of the substance. Second is covalent solids. And covalent solids, this is maybe a little bit hard to uh, uh, kind of kind of understand is but a covalent solid is one big gigantic molecule so what i mean is that there's no attractive forces it's just one big molecule 
of say carbon and they're all held together by covalent bonds and so these have extremely high melting and boiling points and they're extremely hard a common example of this is diamond and so diamond is the hardest substance that we know and again diamond is just a big molecule of carbon it's not molecules it's molecules because there's no attractive forces that hold molecules together it's just one gigantic molecule another example of this is graphite and these are two different forms of carbon And so these are probably the only two examples of covalent solids that you'll ever encounter in this uh, course, diamond and graphite. So very select few are covalent solids. But you know, diamond is something everyone likes to wear, whereas graphite is something that they use in you know, uh, writing uh, pencils. They use graphite sometimes. And so to show you the difference between diamond and graphite is simply just the type of bonds around carbon. So for diamond, we'll put a D for diamond. For diamond, carbon has four single bonds. Whereas graphite, what we do is we take two of those single bonds and we make a double bond. So the only difference between carbon and graphite is uh, not carbon. Uh, diamond and graphite is diamond has four single bonds. Graphite has a double bond and two single bonds. And by changing from two single bonds to a double bond, you're going from something that's very hard, diamond, to something that's very soft, graphite, just by changing the type of bond in that substance and so that's the difference between diamond and graphite is that graphite has two single bonds and a double bond diamond has four single bonds and so those are the only two examples of covalent solids uh, we'll discuss now the other two categories of, co of crystalline solids now remember ionic solids have to have a metal and a non-metal uh, we have molecular solids and so molecular solids are made up of molecules remember covalent solid is made up of one gigantic molecule molecular solids are made up of molecules many molecules and these are held together by attractive forces that we talked about earlier in this lecture they're usually very soft very low melting points compared to other types of solids. Example, ice is a molecular solid. CO2 is a molecular solid. So I'll give you some examples. CO2, NH3, uh, what's another one? I2, F2, uh, N2, uh, what else? CH4, etc. And so, what all of these compounds or solids have in common is that they only contain non metals. So, molecular solids only contain non metals in the formula. So if you look at a formula and you see it only contains non-metals, it's going to be a molecular solid. Whereas ionic solids, you remember, have a metal and a non-metal. Molecular solids only contain non-metals. And it can be the same non-metal or it can be a different non-metal as long as it only has non-metals in the formula. That's a molecular solid. The last type of solid is a metallic solid. And so a metallic solid is just a metal by itself. And it has metallic bonds and 
It has very high conductivity, which will use metals to help in making wires to move electrons. And so again, metallic solids are just metals. So if you see a metal on the periodic table, it's a metallic solid. And examples are like silver, copper. So notice that these are only metals. There's no non-metal attached to it. So if the formula just has a metal, it's a metallic solid, like sodium is metallic solid. Uh, gold is a metallic solid. Iron is a metallic solid. So all of these just show a metal in the formula. There's no non-metal with it. So to recap, ionic solids contain metal and non-metal. Covalent solids, only two examples we discuss, diamond and graphite. Molecular solids only contain non-metals. Metallic solids only have a metal in the formula. And so those are the four types of crystalline solids that we observe. So make sure you're able to uh, select what type of solid is present when given the formula, or if it's asked, for example, which one is a molecular solid when given a list of uh, choices.